All right. Uh, good afternoon. Are we all pretty much situated, I think. This is good. Everyone, did everyone come in from the other developer room? Yes. Everyone still sitting in the developer room, wondering why no one's there. We're good. Did anyone else see that? Okay. I'm not crazy. Oh, that's like a known thing. So that's a known bug. Okay. Um, if you are not a developer in this room, I'm afraid you might be a little lost during this talk. If you understand PHP and you like WordPress, then you hopefully will like this talk. Um, just to start, this is my second work in Boston. I really, really enjoyed it last year. It was a lot of fun. I did a really fun advanced talk with uh, WordPress core developer Daryl Kubersman. Um, the one thing I actually not really like about Boston is that I got a set of stickers that had um, Boston Celtics, Red Sox, uh, and what were the other colors on there? Bruins. And Bruins colors, of course. So for next year, I do want to actually try uh, perhaps a new branding. Perhaps, maybe a little bit. Uh, and so I think, uh, okay, okay, okay. I'm just saying maybe for next year, this could work. Uh, not gonna happen. <laughs> All right, am I in the light, by the way? Can you guys see me? Am I good? All right, because I can only see like this much of Frederick, so I just want to make sure that we're good. Okay, good. Um, so, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Andy Nason. I am a lead developer of WordPress. I live in Washington, D.C. Uh, you, you can find me on Twitter as Nason. Uh, you can find me in real life as Nason. Uh, most people don't actually know what my first name is, I think, at this point. Uh, and today I want to talk about, this is the title of the talk, this is probably the weakest part of the entire talk, uh, building an API to WordPress web. Uh, perhaps it is up to you guys to come up with a better name for the talk when I'm done. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is an API that was new in WordPress 3.4. But I'm actually, only going, I'm actually only using it as a case study to nail down different points. Now the API that I'm going to be talking about is what was called WPT. Uh, the complete rewrite of the Teams API. We're dealing with four, five, six thousand lines of code, uh, many of which had existed for years. Uh, so on the About page for WordPress 3.4, once you update it, you're able to see this basic little thing, WP theme, WP get themes, WP get theme. It's faster, it uses less memory, it makes use of persistent caching. What I'm going to try and explain is not only what does that mean, but rather how are we able to accomplish all of this and what actually should be driving the API development. And what this replaced is it replaced a function called get themes, uh, which basically was the, the most hated function of WordPress, at least from my point of view. Uh, and what actually had happened here is that uh, two years ago, uh, I was a Google Summer of Code student for WordPress, actually working on a project that involved theming. And I had a really, really difficult time working with WordPress because this function was so terrible. So two years later, I decided, you know what? Maybe I can actually maybe rewrite that function and make it a little better. And so first, I guess with, with every approach to WordPress, when we're dealing with API development, we have to think about our gen what are our general considerations. The first one, which, as obvious it might sound, so many open source projects fall prey to this. Don't fix what isn't broken. There are a lot of projects that like to rewrite things because they're able to. Okay? Now, in many cases, we're actually not able to, which is consideration number two. Backwards compatibility. In WordPress, we are always going to be backwards compatible from release to release. That is our goal. If you're upgrading, you're updating from 2.9 to 3.0 to 3.1. These are all major releases. Okay? No code that worked in a previous release should stop working in the current release. That is highly unusual for software. It's very rare for software. In fact, in most cases, software, uh, software projects actually use the opportunity of that major version number. The definition of a major version, indeed, is breaking compatibility from release to release. We don't do that. Now, this is actually really interesting. A lot of people say that's stupid. And a lot of people who say that this is stupid have, you know, then I ask them, like, well, what project do you want? And they name a project that I probably have heard of. And then I say, well, how many users do you have? And they said, we have, you know, 500,000 of them. And I said, well, what happens from release to release? And they say, well, maybe a few people will upgrade, and then slowly but surely everyone else will upgrade. And you can actually see this with, you know, something perhaps like Drupal, 
with each, with, each, with each major version, you have to rewrite a significant amount of your modules. Now, this isn't necessarily a bad thing because it allows them over the period of their release cycle to really update a lot of their code. But at the same time, it really slows down their adoption. And what we're finding in backward compatibility, which is one of our core, most important philosophies, really is fantastic for users, it's great for, e for the ecosystem, and for us, it's actually not a curse. Because it's a blessing as developers in disguise. And one of the biggest benefits to dealing with something that is always going to be backwards compatible is that you don't tear up the carpets and start over every chance you get. It kind of works with the first consideration of don't break, don't fix what isn't broken. Now in this case, very, very broken. So we can kind of move on from that. And the third consideration that I want to propose today is make it work. If you are going to tear up the carpets, throw everything out, and try again, you got to figure out, you got to not only look for backwards compatibility, but you have to look for forwards compatibility as well. What might you want to do a year from now or three years from now? I'm 23 years old. I'm going to be around, for, around WordPress for probably at least the next decade. That's a lot of time to be dealing with, oh crap, this code, I mean, let's put it this way. In three years on the project, I look back at code that I wrote two years ago saying, man, that was terrible. I do, every single day. So imagine what might happen five years from now when I look back at code I wrote seven years ago. How much worse do you think it's going to look? So one of the biggest things that we can do is that we need to look forward to, the, we need to look towards the future as to what we might need to build on this later on. So that extensibility is really important. And so we can start a little bit with where can we improve? And with this particular API, so we have this thing, we have this function called get themes, and get themes loop through every single theme and compile a whole lot of statistics for each theme. And now you have something like get theme. So get theme said, hey, I want information about the current theme. Can I have it? Sure. One second while I calculate the other 50 themes that you're not going to need. This obviously doesn't really work very well. This really doesn't make any sense. You also have this issue where this results in a very bad memory footprint. Your code just isn't very efficient. Not even if it's not efficient in terms of speed, it's just not efficient in terms of the amount of memory that the server actually needs to use to be able to do what you want to do. You're loading more, you're having more data than you're getting. Uh, WordPress uses giant arrays often actually to function arguments. These aren't bad, but giant arrays as return values can be really, really tricky. And that's actually one of the things that ideally we're trying to get away from. The other problem with this is that get themes is really, really slow. A lot of hosts now, for example, DreamHost, actually bundle a lot of themes already when you install WordPress. So when you install WordPress, they take up to 170 public themes that they use on WordPress.com that are free and out there, and you can actually go and browse the code if you wanted to, and they install them directly on your site. Now, if every single one of those themes adds more and more and more data to, and calculations, it's going to get very slow. And this isn't really fair, because you only have one theme active on a site at a time. Maybe two if you're using a parent and a child. So it's not really fair for this to slow down the site. The other problem, too, is that sometimes get themes was really, really um, stubborn. And it would return data in forms that we didn't want it to return. So it would return things in markup, it would return things uh, in, in, very, in different ways that really just wouldn't make a lot of sense. Uh, so it would put the author name in the description, and it would, whenever you wanted the, if you only wanted the author name, you actually couldn't get it. You had to get the author name with the link wrapped around it. Just really weird stuff. Now it made sense at the time because it was coded with WordPress admin and in dashboard in mind. It doesn't really make sense anymore. The other thing too is that the theme headers, the name of the theme, the description of the theme, the author perhaps, these can't actually be translated. Now 2010 might might be a brand but the giant paragraph after it could certainly be translated into other languages. More than a third of all WordPress users are using WordPress in a language other than English. And I'm willing to bet that probably up to another third are, do, are English is not their first language that they're using in English anyways. There is a lot that we can be doing here to help our international users and our international user base. It also has really, really weak error handling. If I wanted to try and figure out if a theme was, was, was properly formed or if something was broken, I really couldn't. We just store everything in this global array and read through it whenever we wanted to. Not very effective. There's also, there was really no good way to actually add any more features to this. 
So if I wanted to add a feature, it would end up returning one more item in an array, which means more data, which means it runs slower. A lot of problems here. It also did some really fun things, like using the name of the theme as something that was unique. Now, there are a few problems. First off, there's no guarantee that two, two themes have or don't have the same name. And there's also this you know, issue with just a statement. Things like this. You actually couldn't have a name uh, with an apostrophe in it for a long time because of like dumb little things like this. This is just, I mean, this is seven-year-old code at this point. It breaks very easily. If that wasn't clear, there are so many issues with this API that it's just, there's just so many things going wrong here. We need to kind of move on from that. It also can't be persistently cached. This is a big problem. When you're calculating maybe 10, 15, 100 themes, let's say you're something like WordPress.com where they have how many millions of users accessing the same 171 themes over and over again. Clearly, everyone knows. Like, we don't need to keep calculating this on every single page load where this data is needed. We certainly don't need to be calculating it on every page load where we only need to worry about one theme. Forget about all 170. And so these ideas that we can actually take all of these operations, all these file system operations, standardization, we can just cache them. Maybe. The other thing is that actually on WordPress.com, and I don't I don't work for automatic, by the way, I don't work for WordPress.com, but obviously I work with a number of them on a daily basis on a lot of things. And they scale WordPress to a really incredible length. So we begin to see some really funky things like this. The data was actually so big that for those of you who are familiar with persistent caching, like APC or memcache, it wouldn't fit in a single spot. It wouldn't fit in a single data. It was that much data. And so what needed to happen, instead they actually had to split it up into multiple pieces to be able to put it into, into their data store. This just, if you have that problem, you're doing something wrong. Like the other thing that's interesting is that page templates. In order to calculate what page templates you have available, you would have to load up to get these. You'd have to load up every single piece of data, and we'd have to calculate page templates for all of them. This makes absolutely no sense, but what actually ends up happening is that pages like the All Pages screen, and if you're actually editing a page, these pages are actually slower than if you're editing posts, because they have all of these page templates, and it just, it just drags everything down. So I think we can kind of, at this point, agree that this original thing, whatever you want to call it, because I don't know if it's really an API, was bad. It did not work well at all. And so now we have to kind of think about, okay, what other things do we need to add on to this? So we need to support the new 3.4 theme customizer. So we have to support this idea of uh, customizing a live theme, you know, your, your, your live previewing a the theme. Who's used this feature, by the way? Theme customizer before. Is it not awesome? Right? It's great. It probably wouldn't be able to happen, certainly not as sanely without things like this. Of course, page templates need to support it. It needs to support the theme editor. The theme editor needs to know what files can be edited. If you're searching and browsing for themes, we're listing a whole lot of things on that page. We're listing the description, we're listing the author, we need all this information. You also need to know whether or not this theme is a screenshot so we can show it. We need to do things like, well, we need to search for a theme, which I'm actually going to talk about in a little bit. Update checks. Themes that are stored in the repository and work on WordPress at all. You can update them. This is another consideration. Some other little things you might not know are themes have, you can actually have multiple themes. And this is very hidden, it's for a very narrow use case, but it does exist. So in addition to having, let's say, WP content themes, all of your themes in there, you can have all of your themes, or you can have another whole set of themes reside somewhere else. You can also group themes into subdirectories. I did not know about this until I started working on this API. I just never realized it before. Uh, so if you have something like you know, 2010, 2011, you can have a folder. And as long as that folder only has more folders of themes, then you're fine. It will work. So you can actually do this. It's really clever. Uh, and parent themes, of course, can kind of traverse this. So you can have a child of 2010 in one folder, and then one level up and three levels over, you have the 2010 where it originally sits. So you have all these different things you need to consider. You also have this concept of allowed themes on multi-site. Who's familiar with multi-site? Who's used it? 
That's almost every hand. That's uh, maybe not surprising at this point. Um, this idea of allowed themes, where if you're running a large network, where you might maybe only want to allow certain themes on certain sites, uh, WordPress.com, for example, has you know hundreds of themes for their VIP clients that obviously you should not be able to activate on you know, nacy.wordpress.com. That doesn't really make any sense. So there's so many different features that we need to deal with here. And on top of that, we can't break anything. It all needs to work. It needs to be entirely backwards compatible with every plugin that's out there. Certainly every plugin that's doing the right thing currently. This is, again, this is that, that second consideration. It's incredibly important to us, and it's something that we do need to stick to. This does not mean, though, that our development is going to be static. We can still move forward. And so let's get started. We can take a look at what get themes actually use to return. You can actually see how ugly this is, in the sense that here's a giant array of things. And what you actually can't quite see is this is an array of PHP files, and this is an array of CSS files. Those two things actually took up more than 40% of the entire memory. And it was only needed on the theme editor. And mind you, you're only, you can only edit one theme at a time. Whole lot of data that you're just not even using, or that we're not using. You have things like author name stored in addition to author, which has the, the other thing. Why? Because we used to use one, and now we need to use the other. We just kept throwing things in there. It's really just not very efficient. So what we decided to do is that we scrapped the array and went with an object. Now, the nice thing about the object is suddenly we can really simplify this pretty significantly. So we can say things like, you know, okay, we have a theme object now, and we can say get the name, get the description, get the URI, and we can now get those information, that, that information back. Now, it's not even calculating any of this beforehand, okay? So if you're doing something maybe like you want to get information for display, it's not translating that header, obviously, before you need it translated. It's not marking up that description with paragraph tags, or it's not wrapping an author name around a, you know, it's not wrapping a link to an author's page around his name unless you really want that. And it's only doing that when you want it. There are also a number of methods to this WPP object. These, you, all of these functions are probably familiar with you. Perhaps maybe not the last two, but certainly the first six are familiar. Get the get style sheet directory URI. The theme object actually has all of these things. Things like get page templates now become a method for an individual theme. And instead of get page templates calling get themes and loading every single theme, now we can isolate one particular theme and say, I want all the page templates just for this theme. I want you to calculate that, only that, and return it to me as fast as possible. It's a big change. If we needed to deal with something like screenshots, potentially even multiple screenshots that you today for a theme. We have this idea of, hey, we need to know what screenshot there is. Well, we don't need to calculate what the screenshot is unless we actually need to display one. And so now we can wait a little longer. This idea of kind of like lazy loading is absolutely as much as possible. Instead of calling things like template files and style sheet files, we can just call it and get files in it. And since it's only needed for one theme at a time on the theme editor, this immediately reduces the memory footprint by 40%. Gone. We're, we're immediately able to reduce so much of that data, so much, so many things that need to be calculated by that one little change. If you have a parent theme, you can simply check, okay, well let's just check the parent method. And if the parent method actually returns something, it will return another theme object. And then you can suddenly start doing things like this. Fine. Echo out the go ahead and echo out the name of this parent. We can just do this. It already works. We can also do things like errors in existence. We can check to see, hey, does this random string that I'm giving to you, does the theme actually exist? Let me know. Does it have errors? Is the theme broken? Let me know. And now this is at this, now we're no longer dealing with this kind of ridiculous array, we're no longer dealing with any of these checks. We now can just know right away, does this theme exist or not? We don't need to load up all the themes and make sure it's not in there, we just need to check that one. And now we can talk a little bit more about some of the magic that is involved in this, because there's a lot of things that need to happen here to, for it to remain back compatible. Our first problem was that we had theme, as in the variable, as in the array returned by get theme, passed everywhere. It was passed into functions, it was passed into filters, it was passed into actions. You name it, we were using it somewhere. Now this is a big problem, because if we had 
an action or a filter that received four or five arguments. We would just have to add the fifth and sixth argument as this newer version. And then the older version would just kind of sit there forever. And that's really silly and it doesn't make a lot of sense. And so enter array object. Who's heard of array object in PHP? A few hands. Array object in PHP, a class that extends an array object, can for the most part mimic an array. And this enables us to do something specific, which is actually accessing an array's keys. Okay? So actually an array object implements a number of things. You can loop through it, you can count it, you can do all sorts of different things here that obviously, I mean, counting an object doesn't make sense, but it can in this case. And so now what we have here is our WP team class actually implements array access. And so now when you call theme with the name key, it doesn't fatal error. But rather, it helpfully gives you back what you requested. That is really handy for backwards compatibility. There was another function in WordPress called current theme info. Current theme info was too good for, the, for, w, for get theme. And so instead what it did is that it just returned its own little like special object to call that. And this object, what we can do is we can use magic methods in PHP, which you've probably heard of, where you can have uh, get or set, or is set, or set or unset, all of these different magic methods. And so now, when you call function, when you call, let's say, team name within the property name, that, that property doesn't exist. We can now map that directly to, oh, you must mean name method. Let me return that value for you. And so now you can kind of see how all of these different pieces of backup compatibility come into phase, come into focus very quickly, and now it all works. You also have problems with sorting. Originally, as you, as you remember, get themes was keyed by name. Now it's really easy in PHP to sort up an array by key, right? It's just case sort, or AR sort, a few other things you can do. Okay? So for example, if you're doing something like a uh, I mean, in this case, it's really uh, get themes one to maybe theme zero. It's more difficult for WPC to actually sort themes by name, okay? how they would normally appear in the So in order to make it go fast, we can do things like sorting things internally. And so the problem here is that you have all these public methods, public methods, and then you have these protected data stores, like an array of headers internally, that you can't access directly. But if you do, let's say, a static method on that class, we can now do things like sort this array of themes for me. And it can automatically make a determination, oh, we're in English, great. I will go ahead and read through all of the raw headers that, I, that you don't have access to, but I do, and sort this as fast as I possibly can. When you're sorting 100 themes or 10 themes, whatever it is, this does make a significant performance difference. We can also talk about things like caching. We can now finally start to cache this data in some kind of the same way. And so the first thing that we did is that we said, well, we can make this non-persistent caching by default. We can decide that uh, by default, well, at least every time you call WP theme, it kind of stores it locally for a little bit, and you call the GAN, it already has that data. It's nice, it's not great, but it's nice. Now, the reason why we couldn't do persistent caching by default, so if you had APC, if you had man cache, it would just work, is that then FTP edits wouldn't refresh the cache. And that's really not fun, because now suddenly users are chasing around caching bugs. That doesn't make any sense. But what we can cache is we can cache a number of different things. We can cache the screenshot. We can cache what the parent team actually is for a child team. We can say, you know, where are our page templates? What are they? That's the easiest question. What are our page templates? I don't know, but I can find out. Sanitizing all the headers. This can be very expensive. So now we can actually cache all that data. And it was actually coded in mind the idea that it can actually support persistent caching. So for sites that have a lot of themes that also need proper code deployment, they can now manage this in a very same way, so it suddenly becomes really fast. And if you wanted to turn this on, let's say you were running a big, a big network or a big environment, there's simply a filter that you can use. Another little thing where, remember earlier, it was uh, get themes had a point up over WP theme for sorting? Well, now the WP theme has a point up on get themes. And this idea is that you have, we want to speed up a multi-site install that uses, let's say, allowed themes. So in the case of WordPress.com, as an example, because this is really, this is exaggerated from most people I'm dealing with, 
They have 170 public meetings, and let's just say 1,000 VIP meetings. So if you wanted to know the page templates for your 2010 theme, it would need to load up all 1,170 themes, calculate all the page templates for all of them, and then hand you back your default side chart. That's kind of sad. I mean, that's actually really sad, right? But that's how it worked. But now what we can do is we can just get rid of all of the themes that aren't allowed right away. The allowed themes were stored as an array of theme slots. And now our big giant array of themes is actually all keyed by the theme slot. So we can just use something like array intersect key, simple PHP method, simple uh, PHP function, to just, sim just get rid of all. I don't want to deal with any of those themes. I know I'm not allowed to use them. So don't even instantiate them. I don't want them. And now you're suddenly loading up not even 170, but in many cases just one thing. And so now we have all these functions that we were able to bundle up and get rid of, and now it produces just two. WD get theme and WD get theme. We can choose whether or not we want themes that are allowed, whether we want themes that have errors or not. We can still show broken themes in the interface. It's just a really, really effective way to do it. So now that I've covered what the theme, what the API actually does, I can talk a little more about how we were actually able to do it. And with I, this API could not have been written the way it was without two very important things. The first is functional testing, unit testing. WordPress uses PHP unit for its test framework. We were, able to very, we were able to check, hey, do all of the existing tests work? So we can do this. All of the existing tests that use get themes, if get themes was 100% back and compatible, ideally all of these tests should pass. And they did. So just having the test we already wrote, we're able to take care of back, a lot of our backwards compatibility concerns. New tests were written to ensure that WP theme return will be expected. Very simple, expected versus actual. And then every time we ran into a bug after WP theme actually went into WordPress 3.4 before we released it, we would write a test first. This test fails and it passes with this pass. So test driven development was really, really important once you're dealing with bugs. And the other thing that we were able to, that I was able to do really, really, uh, that was really helpful for this is profiling. And I don't mean your normal profiling of, let me run this for loop 10,000 times and see if it's faster or slower than the other for loops. That's not profiling. This is profiling. We talk about things like using K cache grind and X debug. So by, first off, by lazy loading everything that we had already talked about, the memory footprint itself is four times smaller. But now what we can look at is we can actually look at specific numbers on a profiling output. And so in this case, this is let's say on the all pages screen. So if you're going to all pages, it actually has to load up the page templates in the back. Now normally, you would just go and you'd see all your pages, and the page would be rather slow anyways, right? But now it's going to be really slow. And what you actually see is that's a percentage. It says 28.62. 28.62% of the entire processing time for that page was spent in theme.php. Even worse, if you look down here, 69% of all processing time was spent in get themes or in something that get themes called. All you wanted to do is get pages, but yet it's calling all of these other things. So we were able to find a bottleneck very quickly. Oh wow, this is fairly obvious. This is how it looks like in 3.4. 0.39% rather than 69% of the entire page was spent dealing with this. That's not bad, right? <laughs> the total time cost, the time cost in the case of Xdebug, in, in the case of this is uh, 1 million time cost uh, units is one second. So you can see we went from 5.7 million to 1.1 million of processing time. Now these are, these are uh, it's difficult to kind of prepare two profiling outputs, but when they're that different, it's fairly obvious what's going on. When you look on one side, it's wow, it's 70% and less than one half of a percent. And all you wanted was pages. Profiling also helps you identify bottlenecks. Not just the bottleneck that I knew was there. I knew that page was slow, but I didn't know about something else. So when you went for a search, when you searched for a theme 
on themes. Okay, so you went to appearance themes and you searched for a theme that existed. You used the search box. 44% of the entire page load was spent doing formatting stuff. So more than, almost half of the entire page load was spent calling sanitized title with dashes. Now for those of you who might know what this function is, is that it takes a title of a post and converts it to, you know, hyphens, which would appear in the URL. It's a, it's a very expensive function to run. And in this case, we were calling it 3,529 times. That's really not very effective. So why are we doing that? Well, with King Cash Grind, I'm able to actually visualize exactly what's calling what. This is why profiling is so cool. I was able to look at very specifically, oh wow, so search theme is the, is the function that was calling sanitized title dashes for 42% of the page load. Why does this happen? This, I mean, really, like, this, is, this doesn't make any sense. Why could we possibly be sanitizing that many times? And so here's the function, or the method, rather, search theme. So here's what it does. Let's say you have a theme. Uh, it, it has uh, one particular theme that it's searching at a time. So it's calling the search theme method for every single theme that you have. And it's basically, if you found it, if this is a match return true, if it's not return false. Okay? And now we can talk about this idea of, well, it's looping through the search terms one by one. And then it's calling sanitized title with dashes on the theme tags. The theme tags that are already in a style CSS file, comma separated. These don't need to be sanitized. So we look at this, we have the search terms of 2010. We have themes installed would be 171 in this case. Average tags per theme, 20.8. 3,500 tags that were sanitized. Removing it, which because it wasn't needed, ended up speeding up the searching by 50%. Okay, the time cost was the 30% of the original one you were done. And so now finally, some lessons on this. One is that backwards compatibility presents challenges for developers. It is not easy, but it doesn't prevent us from innovating. And that's really, really important to emphasize. It, can, it does not prevent you from innovating in order to do things like this. Testing and profiling is great for checking your work. But you should also use it to inform your original approach. I, before I wrote a single line of code for this, I profiled every single page that I can find that was using it to see where the bottlenecks actually were, to see actually what was taking the most time. I can optimize one function in five hours. But if that function actually is pretty quick, I should probably spend more time on another function that can be, that's going, that is actually much slower. And finally, WordPress continues to evolve at an incredibly fast pace. Uh, and with that, I will say that our current goal for WordPress 3.5 is December 5th or bust. Uh, I hope perhaps that this talk has kind of gotten you to think a little more about testing, a little more about profiling, but also a little, a little more about contributing to core. So if this talk interested you, I, really like rock your, you know, you know, your mind is blown, you really like it, you like what we're doing, come join us. We start WordPress 3.5 development next week. Thank you very much. With that, uh, I believe closing remarks start in about five, ten minutes. If there are any questions with regards to any of this, First, and then if you have more time, which you probably won't, any other general work with development questions. Is it hands? Yes? Microphone. Oh, oh, microphone. There's a microphone up front. Any questions about this? Profiling, WordPress development, WordPress core, WordPress.org. No questions? Is my talk really bad? Okay. I covered it all. I don't think so. Um, how long did it take me to make these revisions? Six days. Uh, my fiance was not happy with me. I worked about, I think I worked put about 80 hours in during that time to do this. Uh, it, was, it was definitely a, a slow process because there were so many things that needed to happen to actually build this API. 
to the point where it, it actually was two years of thinking because I had struggled with it prior, uh, you know, prior to this. Uh, and so when it actually needed to you know, come to fruition, we actually had a number of features in 3.4 that we locked that needed something like this, that needed more functionality. And so this wasn't even slated for 3.4 originally. And I just started writing it, and I, uh, you know, hold myself up in my office, and uh, it was ready the next week. And uh, there were, uh, I mean, there was actually, I believe, a total of 68 changes after that six-day period. So it was another month, probably, of continuing to fix bugs and add enhancements. So it certainly wasn't only that time, but all of the initial stuff that you saw there was, was considerations that happened at a rapid fire pace, very, very quickly. Any other questions? Yeah. So, you can have to get closer to the phone. Oh, it's not working? No, it's working. Uh -huh. it yeah, it's working. Yeah, okay. So, customize that PHP, the uh, ability to edit the theme. Yeah. Do you see the ability to, uh, I think that is a part of the basic way for people to be able to uh, choose a theme, style a theme, completely edit, blog options, and like maybe even like, uh, uh, so I guess I mean yes in a general thought um, the customizer is a really cool feature but that's only the ground one that's the that's first level there are so many things that we can build on top of it we can start to do things like widgets I mean I love the idea of drag dropping widgets on the front page of your site why not we can probably do that at some point. Uh, there are so many things that we can do there. It's a really great framework. Daryl Cooper Smith did both of the work on it. He did a fantastic job. It was, I mean, tremendous. Uh, but it, it, I think the most exciting thing about that isn't the feature in 3.4, but rather what it kind of opens up the door, doors for. Uh, and then also, it's a different paradigm of, of working as developers and also as users. Uh, and I don't think that's a bad thing at all. So it's a really, really good evolution there. Any other questions? Yes. How many people contribute to the next upgrade? Uh, the total number of people who contributed to WordPress 3.4 were 186, I believe. So there are, on average, about 200 people who have contributed every four to five months, every four to six months, however long the release takes, uh, since I've at least been keeping track. So for the last four or five years now. Uh, I believe it's uh, 600 or 700 unique individuals who have contributed to WordPress, uh, solely based on, on code that made it into WordPress in the last two years. But you also have things like support, documentation, testing, bug reporting. These are all very important too. That, that, those numbers aren't included in that at all. And uh, there are so many more people who are involved in the community. Um, who here is a core contributor? That is awesome. I see about a half dozen hands. That's a very good population out of this just room, right? So if I went to every WordCamp, there's like 75 of them a year, and six people raise their hands, that's a pretty good number of people who are contributing to it. That's great. I know, Aaron, you're at like every one, but still. <laughs> um, and that, that's really important. But if you do want to get involved, uh, I would follow make.wordpress.org. Make.wordpress.org. Uh, we'll be launching uh, the 3.5 release cycle uh, this week. And it would be really great for you to get involved. If it's not in feature development, then maybe it's in API development or bug fixing or something like that. I, and honestly, like, those of you who are developers who work for us every day have surely found a bug or something that really annoys you. That pet project, that, you know, that pet peeve is what gets so many people hooked on contributing to us. Uh, that's what got me, that's what got me involved. So. With that, I am out of time. Thank you guys very much. I really appreciate it.